let me just share with you quickly how I got started. You would never imagine this. In 1982, when I was finishing up my Harvard Master's in Public Health, and I was asked, would I, would like, to, would I like to participate in educating gay folks and others about this thing called gay-related immune deficiency? This was before it was called AIDS. And I said, nah, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with that disease at all. I don't want to think about that at all. Here I am, 15 years later, 16 years later, and what am I doing? Traveling around the world, telling people about the man-made origins of AIDS and Ebola. I was working over here. My favorite area of research and teaching was in self-care, healthy human development, motivational psychology, teaching people, like Danny does, how to take better care of themselves, boost their immune systems. So I was really into that. I love that. That's my favorite thing. And one day, kind of like the miracle happened where there was a crisis and I was the right person at the right time. It was the 1990, July 27th, 1990, when the case of the Florida dental AIDS tragedy hit the press. You remember the case of the Florida dentist who infected his patients with the AIDS virus? And three years, at that time I was serving as the world's leading dental and medical catalog supply company's chief professional advisor. And my background was in media, health education, health promotion, fear, because I worked on dental phobia reduction therapy programs, behavioral therapy programs to allay people's fear, going to the dentist. And I had been a dentist for 16 years in health education and media, persuasion, technologies. And here the media was making so many people afraid to go see their dentists in the wake of this case. So I was asked, I was told, I was given the job opportunity to develop patient educational literature to help allay people's fear of going into dental medical practices. So I started to research. The Centers for Disease Control's official investigation reports on the case, I first found them to be scientifically questionable. I then found them to be scientifically bogus. And then later found them to be fraudulent. They had literally covered up, deleted the most incriminating evidence against the dentist who I had to conclude after three years of studying this case and publishing three scientific reports, literally having to go out of the United States to publish because the American Dental Association, American Medical Association wanted to maintain a cover-up. And I wrote a book that was based on those three scientific reports called Deadly Innocence, my ninth book, wherein I had to conclude that the dentist, based on all the evidence, using the FBI's own behavioral science literature, how they themselves investigate and evaluate these types of cases, that this dentist, scientifically trained, military dentist for much of his career, very intelligent dentist, believed that he was dying of a virus that the government had created. They covered that up. He believed that they had intentionally injected this virus during a 1978 experimental hepatitis B vaccine that was given to a lover of his that he had in 1985. And that's how he got infected. And he believed that this was genocide. And he believed in what was called the World Health Organization Theory of AIDS. The videotape that Danny stated he saw, the Strecker Memorandum, was what Dr. David Acker believed that the World Health Organization, the United States Public Health Service, Centers for Disease Control had something to do with the development of these types of viruses and the deployment of them through hepatitis B and other vaccines in Africa and North America. In essence, I have to conclude at the end of that case that the dentist most plausibly was an, identical to an organized serial killer. He maintained a classic organized serial killer personality. You know like the Unabomber? These people, they all, according to the FBI, kill for the sake of power, control, and revenge. Revenge being the major theme. And the principal issue, his principal vendetta was screaming loud and clear in the legal testimonies that was against the federal government. In essence, I concluded that he created a crime. He did what all organized serial killers love to do. They manipulate the authorities into Catch-22s. The Unabomber, he publishes his manifesto in the New York Times, Washington Post. says, here's what I believe. You try to get me. David Acker, the Florida dentist, was virtually identical to this. In essence, he created a crime, a mystery that could not be solved without implicating the government. Because if they told the truth, if they said he was an organized serial killer, then the whole world would want no motive. And the motive was screaming loud and clear in the legal testimony, which they buried. So, 
There was one document, however, that came along with that videotape called the Strecker Memorandum that Strecker sent to David Acker. And it was the most horrifying document I had ever seen. It was a 1970 Department of Defense appropriations request for $10 million for a five-year study to develop immune system ravaging microorganisms for germ warfare. And it said right in this document that the National Academy of Sciences, National Research Council, the most esteemed of all health science agencies in America, not only informed the Department of Defense that, quote, over the next five to ten years it will be possible to make a new infective microorganism that could differ in certain important aspects from any known disease causing microorganism. And most important of these is that it would be refractory to the immunologic and therapeutic processes upon which we depend to maintain our relative freedom from infectious diseases, end quote. And they not only told the Department of Defense that, this esteemed health science agency, but that, and that it would cost them $2 million a year over five years to do it, but that they would help them to do it. So I believed our government at the time was not particularly trustworthy, but you know, I could not imagine that this document was legitimate. I lived in denial, like most people, most Americans, most people worldwide are living in denial today because they are so brainwashed, they are brain dead. I lived in denial just like that. I said, okay, I've, seen, I've heard some weird things, but here I'm looking at this and it looks legitimate. So what do I do? All I know now is I've got the World Health Organization theory and I've got this document I know Perhaps, maybe, if this document is legitimate, and indeed it was. In fact, what they were looking for specifically was in the congressional record. This was in the congressional record. They were looking for a, quote, super germ, end quote. That word was in the congressional record. That could wipe out the human being's immune system, the defense system against infectious disease and diseases, leaving us, human beings, susceptible to the opportunistic infections like tuberculosis, like candidiasis, like yeast infections, like pneumonia, and like cancers. So this is what they're looking at. So ultimately, what did I do? I went back to Harvard's Countway Medical Library, where I did most of my postdoctoral research. And I go to the World Health Organization Chronicle Files, and where do I begin? I start in 1965. Why? I figure, well, if the money maybe kicked in in 1970, let me go five years before that and five years after that. And so, I start by pulling World Health Organization Chronicle, their monthly journal, off the shelves and I begin to read what they are involved in. And I was surprised as a public health professional who over the previous five years had four times presented scientific papers at the American Dental Public Health Association meeting, I knew very little about the World Health Organization. Astonishing. I found out that this was like the godfather to the pharmaceutical industry. That they create the standards upon which the pharmaceuticals and the drugs, including the vaccines, are based. And they largely, I learned, helped to determine which drugs remained legal and which ones would be illegal. It took me a while before I learned that this organization was largely controlled by the Rockefellers. But you see, by 1965, they had already had about five to seven years under their belt in what was called the Virus Cancer Research Network. They were developing a cancer virus research network. And that by 1970, they reported <clears throat> that they had isolated well over 70,000 different strains of viruses. And when they said, quote, isolated, unquote, it took me a, another few weeks and months before I learned that 